The diamond I realized is that I have to be careful. This is one time I am wearing a diamond. It was a natural feeling. It goes on eventually. It's a great experience. The Empathy Museum presents Walking into Empathy. If you'd been walking along a quiet London street in February 2018, not far from the River Thames, you might have stumbled across a giant shoebox. Look more closely and you'll see there's a huge barcode on the side, with a sign. It says, please do come into our shoe shop and try walking a mile in someone else's shoes. Literally. Hi. Hey. Hi, yeah. So essentially, we're the Empathy Museum and this is a mile in my shoes. My name's Claire Patey and I'm an artist and a curator and I'm the director of the Empathy Museum. The Mile in My Shoes project is um, like an alternative shoe shop and visitors come into the shoe shop but instead of buying a pair of shoes they would get fitted with a pair of shoes that belong to a stranger. Um, Then they get a pair of headphones and an mp3 player and they would head out of the shoe shop for a mile's walk in that stranger's shoes whilst they're listening to that stranger telling them a story about their life. What shoe size are you? Seven. Seven, fantastic. Just bear with me one second. I think shoes are very powerful and I think there's there's an awful lot of actors who talk about just starting with the shoes. They're the thing that comes between your feet and the ground somehow, there's something about that. Great, so this is a seven. This is Myrtle, so if you just pop these shoes on. Trainers. Trainers, yes, yeah, so they should be all right. Yours, <laughs> and then uh, we'll just pop your shoes in the box while okay. you're out. And then I'll show you how the tech works. There is something about it that's like embodying that person somehow. And it, you, you put their shoes on and, it, and you look down and you don't recognise your own feet, which is disconcerting in a way, but it's also incredibly intimate to put on somebody else's shoes. What do you think? It's great. But I don't need to undo them. Uh, you can do slip them if on. Like. If they slip on, then that's absolutely fine. Also, I think there's a kind of element of play about it. It's a tiny bit theatrical, or it's a bit like when you're a kid and you try on your mum's high heels and walk around the kitchen in them. There's some, something of that kind of play around it. And then that teamed up with the voice, there is something very um, transformative about it. It takes, really takes you to another place. Hang on. So Myrtle, these are Myrtles? Yeah, these are Myrtles. So um, she donated the shoes and one of our audio producers would have chatted to her for about one to four hours and then cut that down into a ten minute um, audio experience for you to listen to. There you are. Thank you very much. See you soon. My name is Myrtle Monroe. I've been a registered nurse from 1994. One of the, the the experiences that I had that kind of changed me in the sense that it made me a bit stronger. I remember a young lady, a white British young lady, she came in and she took an overdose of some medicine. She, she was trying to kill herself. The others were busy, so I went to attend to her, went to do something else, and on my way back, I can hear her saying to my colleague, I didn't want that black nurse to look after me. I think that empathy is, has been important as a theme in a lot of work that I've done in the past. I'm, I'm interested in public spaces and I'm interested in places where people can come and be with one another and share conversation. We actually tend to surround ourselves with people who are very, very like us, who don't challenge our assumptions or our values or our identities. And um, this is a kind of way to counter that. And I said to her, it is within your right to choose who looks after you. And I don't have a problem with that. However, to decide that you don't want me to look after you because of the colour of my skin just doesn't seem right when you are the one trying to kill yourself. I'm quite happy in the colour of my skin and I walked away very angry and tearful. You know, but it's things like that, experiences like that that made me realise that I wasn't in Trinidad anymore (laughs) and I was in a different place. Yeah, one of the stories that made me, that that challenged my preconceptions was the story from a sex worker um, who's called Sage and she's from Perth in Australia. 
Hi, I'm Sage. I, I worked in the sex industry, but I prefer to call myself a, a sexual healer. Sex work is not the, uh, the job that you think you're going to land in. If I looked back and, and you told 14-year-old me that I would be a sex worker, I would have laughed, embarrassingly. <laughs> I'm sure that this isn't true of every sex worker, but her story is a story of healing, really. And it's a story of acceptance and non-judgment. Shame would be the word that comes along in working in the industry and I think that's that's the hardest thing and it's hard to walk in, in both worlds. Like to know that you're going into a job and being with this person and doing good, like seeing someone be, and it's not just the sex part, but you're, they walk away with a, you know, a bit of self-confidence and, and a sense of themselves and but then we get out into society and, and we have to hide it a little bit or you know, even though I like to educate, I think towards the end I felt like I was more justifying, having to justify myself. I found a lot of them very difficult to listen to. There's stories from Syrian refugees that I found difficult to listen to. There's a story from a woman who was in a, a terrible boat accident and lost her husband and her daughter and her leg. But I think what struck me that we, we spoke to one um, guy from Syria who's a dentist called Yazan. When the bombing started, it was just beyond imagination. The sound, the, the bombing, the... The fear, uh, it was really, really bad. Afterwards, we talked to him about what the experience had been like for him to share his story. And he um, spoke really eloquently about how here he's quite often invited to tell his story, but people want to hear the story of his terrible journey or they want to talk to him about the politics of the region. They don't want to talk to him about being a dad or a dentist or all of the other things that make up who he is. And he said it was really very cathartic for him to share himself as the whole Yazan. Um, Yazan, not just the refugee, but Yazan, the entire person. So my name is Roman Krasnarik. I'm a writer, a philosopher, and I'm founder of the Empathy Museum. I think it matters today because we're at a moment of empathy crisis. There's a global growing empathy deficit. It's time for a sense of empathy to infuse our politics in America. One of the great turning points in the modern history of empathy was when Barack Obama in 2007 started talking about the United States' empathy deficit. In fact, he said it was more important than the federal deficit, or the budget deficit. If we hope to meet the moral test of our times, if we hope to eradicate child poverty or AIDS or joblessness or homelessness or any of the other issues that were chronicled before I came on stage, then I think that we're going to have to talk more about the empathy deficit, the ability to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes, to see the world through somebody else's eyes. There's a very famous study showing declining levels of empathy amongst US college students, showing that empathy levels have dropped by about 50% in the last three decades. And that's led to a whole load of replicated studies showing similar patterns in other countries. And there's a big question, well, why is empathy on the decline? Now, in the short term, the obvious reason is digital culture, that we're getting trapped in our digital silos. We're not interacting or talking to people or hearing about people who are different from us. But empathy has also been on decline, I think, for longer term reasons. It's to do with our culture of hyper-individualism and consumer culture, where the big question today is, what's in it for me? You know, and self-help culture has fed into that. There, the question is really, you know, who am I, not who are you? And I think we need to make a shift to an age of what I call outrospection rather than introspection. Outrospection is all about discovering who you are, not by looking inside yourself, but by stepping outside yourself, discovering the lives of other people and other cultures. And empathy is the ultimate art form for creating a new age of outrospection. It's certainly true that some people are naturally more empathetic than others. Um, studies show, for example, that women tend to resonate or reflect back other people's emotions more than men do. It's certainly true that as you go up the hierarchy in companies, people tend to be less empathic. People become distant from those underneath them. And there's a famous statistic saying that you know, top managers are four times more likely to be sociopaths than the people lower down the hierarchy. Of course, and that's really what hierarchies do to people. But over time, we can all develop our empathic brains. And 
for me, the real question is not who's got it and who hasn't, but what are you going to do with the empathy that you've got? You know, that's the really important question. Okay. Well, this is Dr. Patricia Moore, known to the world as Patty, the mother of empathy, um, one of the founders of the Universal Design Movement, and someone who fights with every bit of passion that she can muster for inclusivity by design. Throughout the last century, there have been what I think of as great empathic revolutionaries, people who have done extraordinary things in terms of stepping into other people's shoes and expanding empathy. And one of those people is the American designer Patricia Moore. And in the 1970s, she conducted the most extraordinary empathy experiment where she dressed herself up as an 85-year-old woman trying to experience what is it like to be an older person. She put on fogged up glasses so she couldn't see and plugged up her ears. And she spent three years going around over 100 US cities, which she did at the age of 26. And out of that, she came up with extraordinary design innovations. One of them is you'll find in your kitchen, when you open the drawer, you might have one of those thick rubber handled potato peelers or can openers. That's Patty Moore's invention, the OXO Good Grip, it's called. That was one of those moments in the design world where everyone stood and to attention and sat up, took notice, because it was very successful. And of course, when anything is successful, people want to replicate it. But for me, the success wasn't so much the monetary success, but just the wave of, of awareness that was created Every source of media, all the print and TV and even radio, covered um, this wondrous little thing that we did by making it easier for someone who had trouble holding a utensil, a tool, to manage now with a properly designed offering so that they could have the dignity of design, so that they could manage the, the activities of their daily living and most specifically food preparation. We don't think about it when we're younger, of course, but there could come a day where even holding a fork to feed ourselves will become impossible. The answer is not the medical community, it's design. And so um, I always turn to that moment and realize what, what a wondrous thing it was. Her life and her work is a model for empathy in the workplace, because what it shows is that empathy is a key to innovation. When you understand someone else's life, you can do much more creative thinking. And that's why designers and architects and many people in creative fields think that empathy is so important. When I was able to do the empathic research, I have to admit I never thought to the future of what the applications might be. But I'm so delighted now looking back, you know, we're about to celebrate the 40th anniversary of, of the start of that work. If, if I've accomplished one thing in my career, I'm just delighted that it's been that forever and always designers now recognize their power, uh, even their authority over the business community. And I'm pushing now into governance as well to uh, be more empathetic, to recognize our role in helping others, not designing for people, but designing with people as equals. So we'll go around the circle and sing. Ready? Hello, baby heaven, and how are you? How are you? How are you? Hello, baby. Well, the best place to learn empathy is at home, when it's modeled by your parents or your caregivers, and you see them listening to others, not interrupting them, trying to understand someone else's perspective. And you can also learn empathy in schools. And one of the world's best empathy teaching programs is called Roots of Empathy that developed in Canada. And I think every child should have the right to doing programs like Roots of Empathy. How are you? How are you today? So I'm Katie Cohen and I'm the UK manager for Roots of Empathy. Roots of Empathy was started 22 years ago by a woman called Mary Gordon. She is an educationalist, social entrepreneur. Um, she was a, a teacher herself. And she really wanted a way of um, reaching all children and helping to stop the cycles of violence that happen. 
it's about so developing social emotional literacy, but it's not just aimed at bullies or just aimed at the victims. It's about everybody building that cohesion together. And we are now in 12 countries. Uh, we're a charity, uh, and we've worked with close to a million children across the world. Does someone want to come to hear what they see different about Evelyn? Yeah, she, oh, by herself. She can sit by herself. So today, baby Evelyn and her mum, Libby, came to visit um, Ashburnham Community School, Year 5, and their instructor, Christine, was guiding them through their family visit. And today, the family visit was about safety. And um, we are in West London. You can learn empathy, but we like to say that it's not taught, it's caught which is why we do an experiential learning program. So it's very hard to sit in a classroom and say, this is how to understand empathy and to learn it and you know, to give it in a, a traditional kind of education way. But to experience the love between a parent and baby and that very innate empathic relationship is really at the heart of humanity. To see that played out for you around the green blanket is is really um, quite a magical thing. Should we try here maybe on, the, mm. on here to see? So even if she's not talking, what is she communicating to, to Libby? What is she... I think he's saying that I'm not comfortable in this position. Yeah. We've done about 18 years of independent research, so Roots of Empathy was set up in Canada 22 years ago. Uh, and we've had independent research conducted alongside the programme um, for 18 years. And what we find is that aggression goes down and pro-social behaviours go up. You learn how other people feel. If you if you if you didn't know how other people felt, you might be really mean, and they, and you might not have friends. I think it is important because, like, you you have to respect others as you want to be respected yourself. And like, if you are rude to everyone, everyone will be rude back to you. And like, you'll be like, oh, they've been rude to me, but you can't do anything about it because you've done the same thing to them. One of the places where you can really see empathy in action is in hospitals and in doctor's waiting rooms and doctor's offices because their people are coming along, patients are coming along and they often have had traumatic experiences or they've had emotional experiences, physical ones that they want someone to listen to them and doctors need to be open to patients. My name is Sadashna Davidson and I'm, I'm a GP working in Sheffield. How are you today? I'm okay. You're all right? Yeah. I'm just struggling a little bit with pain relief at the moment. Okay. Empathy is important in a clinical setting for a lot of different reasons. Well, the main thing is because you're dealing with people. And you're dealing with real people that have real lives, real emotions, real fears. And they bring that to the appointment. This is a very simple example. Um, you might see someone with what you think is quite a trivial illness, maybe you know, a short-term cough or cold, but that person might be coming in and asking for a sick note. You've then got to put yourself in their position and understand things from their point of view. And this person, it might be just a trivial cold that they have, but this is on a background of someone that's looking after, is a carer for someone else that's actually quite disabled, and they have multiple children and a second job, and actually this cold is the one thing that's tipping them over from being able to function and keep afloat to actually breaking down and having a major illness. So, so sometimes um, having empathy means that you can give better quality care because you're understanding where someone's coming from. Yeah. While you're here, would you mind if we just checked your blood pressure? Yeah, that's fine. What we can definitely show scientifically is that we have emotion. And if we can show emotion when somebody else has experienced something, that is probably empathy. And we also know that there are psychopaths and people with psychopathic tendencies. And that's when uh, somebody that has a psych is psychopathic personality or is a psychopath does not have empathy. And we can show that on scans. And, and what I've seen and, and read about is experiments where people have done brain scans and things where they've shown people emotive 
pictures or images or topics and they've seen how the brain lights up in different areas connected to emotion and I suppose if you give someone a stimulus which is happening to themselves they will obviously feel emotions but if you're showing someone a stimulus of something happening to somebody else if that person is still experiencing emotion I would interpret that as empathy. 112 over 78, that is spot on. Brilliant blood pressure. Thank you. I I did have some surprising and interesting responses to my Mile In My Shoes podcast. I'm a bit of a Twitter addict. And first of all, I have um, size eight feet. So my feet are quite big for a woman. And the shoes that I donated was a pair of red heels. So the first time I saw um, any reference to my contribution was a picture of uh, a man in a suit wearing my red shoes, which was highly amusing. But actually, and more seriously, in addition to that, um, I did see people link to my recording, saying that it was actually quite inspiring and quite a candid description of what it's like to be a GP and the rewards and the stresses uh, involved with it, which I found incredibly flattering. Hey, I'm back. I don't know if I actually went a mile. I went around the block. Um, so I can sit down and take these off. Now at 65, I, I often do have the opportunity to reflect. Have we seen improvements in 40 years? Are, are we as a people globally more empathetic? And I suppose it depends on the day and the headlines at hand. Uh, some days I'm feeling very, very positive, very much Pollyanna very full of hope, and other days I, I, I find it hard to get out of bed, I won't lie to you. So I believe that we need an empathy revolution, and anybody interested in changing the world has to care about empathy and can't believe that could just happen through rationality. As you come in, it will look very similar to a shoe shop. So it has shelves with shoe boxes. Each shoe box has a label with the size of the shoes and the name of the person that those shoes belong to. So it might just say, these shoes belong to Gary, for instance. I will look at people now and everyone has got a story. Everyone's got a little something inside them and we all do things for a reason. Because I changed so much as a person, when I meet my old friends who are criminals, you know, a lot of them are still active criminals, they can't believe that I'm the same person. I suppose the themes of the stories are quite common. So the themes are joy or loss or grief or love. But when people come in and they try on a pair of shoes, it's it's kind of different for everybody because of what you're bringing to the story yourself. Most people come back and they want to talk about it. What you really want to do is to have a mile in my shoes and then have the cafe next door and for everybody who's been on it to be able to come and sit down and have a cup of tea afterwards and talk about what it's brought up for them because it brings up something for everyone. Walking into Empathy was produced by Henrietta Harrison for Loftus Media. The shoes you've just heard about are part of a growing collection hosted by the Empathy Museum's A Mile In My Shoes exhibition. Inside its giant shoe box, you'll find everything from a pair of well-worn boxer's boots to a pair of peep-toe ballet pumps. And with each pair of shoes comes the owner's story. A snapshot of someone else's life. A chance for you to walk a mile in their shoes. The shoes and stories come from all over the world and are now being made available as podcasts. Listen and subscribe to A Mile In My Shoes to get a new story every week. And follow at Empathy Museum on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram to find out where we are going next.